Good evening to you all. Thank you for turning out on Valentine's night. I have, of course, um, upset my wife immensely. <laughs> uh, but she uh, is watching on Zoom. So uh, my performance will be monitored closely by her. Get the third degree when I get back. Anyway, my name is Christopher Wise. I'm, I'm a secretary of the society. Um, and have been for about 10 years. And one thing I've, I've learned about society members is that you've got a great body of knowledge in so many disciplines. Now, this evening's lecture, uh, given by Hugh, um, who I'll introduce in a moment, covers numerous disciplines, but not to any great depth. So I don't think any of us should be out, out of depth at any point. I rather hope that this will stimulate some discussion because. As the story unfolds, you will realize that we have some issues, some problems, and a heck of a lot of opportunities, which society sadly is missing. And so I really want to see whether or not, for the body of the Kirk and from our online people, are there ideas, are there thoughts from your own experiences and your own careers that we could embrace? So I now have to apologize on behalf of Dan who is not able to be with us at the start of the evening. Uh, he's stuck somewhere at Heathrow trying to pick his partner up, I believe. Um, but he will be joining us later, halfway through, probably on, on Zoom. So apologies on his behalf for not introducing. So I'm actually going to, it's a bit of a dog and a pony show. I'm going to come and talk a little later on about the issues and try to uh, garner your thoughts uh, and, and inputs. But the lecture this evening is going to be given by Hugh. Hugh has... Uh, uh, a PhD from Imperial, and for most of his professional career, he has been a lecturer here and finished as being a dean of agricultural science. He's retired now, like the rest of us, but, but many of us know that he retires as a full time occupation. Um, one of his occupations is being a trustee of the Hypochlorous Acid Trust, uh, and he managed to con me into becoming a co trustee because we need the three trustees from the Charities Commission's point of view. I've known for four, him for 40 odd years. Um, and we share not only this interest, but also common interest in old cars, but that's mm -hmm. another story for another evening. Anyway, how many of you, before this lecture sort of was announced, have heard of hypercrisis? How many of you know not yet. How many of you know what it's capable of? Right. By the end of the evening, all hands will be up, I hope. Brilliant. So we're going to tell you a story, um, and it will just unfold. We're going to cover, as I said, several aspects of hypochlorous acid, um, and I hope you will enjoy it. Um, and we look forward to the discussions a little bit later on. Okay. Over to you, Hugh. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. Well, I feel as if my career has reached a peak this evening. It's a pleasure to, to be here to talk to you because I know I've got a very willing audience, a very well educated and very friendly audience, according to yeah. Chris. Um, they don't bite. <laughs> <laughs> and for that reason, I've put together a presentation which covers many of the facts that you can pick up you know, from the internet and from reading around. But I put it together with a more personal story of how I came to know hypochlorous acid and what I did with it and perhaps the mistake we are now. Uh, and uh, it also gave me great pride to uh, be a part of the trustees of the HOCL Trust for Hygiene and Safe Water. Uh, because it gave me the chance to carry on my interest when it was seeping away at one point. And I'd like to relate many things about HSCL that you can't pick up on the net too easily. And so you will have a sort of a hybrid lecture uh, between the facts and my story. One of the important things about the HSCL Trust, which I'm, I suppose I'm representing today, is that we are advocates for a molecule, which is pretty unusual. Water, I suppose you could call a molecule, and that's advocated as well. But we um, don't generate any money. Um, we 
generating that keeps going. The trustees aren't paid, uh, and we don't get paid expenses either. So we're doing it out of the goodness of our heart because we're committed to this molecule and its potential. We want the maximum amount of good things to come from the use of the HOCL molecule. Now, uh, during the talk, there will be examples of products. There are no recommendations. We're not supporting any particular products. I mentioned products, they're there because they give an example of how the molecule works rather than anything else. And all of the information that I will pass on to you will have scientific basis. There will be sound, substantial, and validated information. One or two things might just squeak through that. <laughs> but it, in the whole, it is sound information. And that's one of the great ambitions that the HOCL Trust has, is to convey scientifically sound information to people. And we're trying to do it in a form that's easily understood. So for that reason, this is not going to be a lecture on biology, chemistry, biology, um, uh, biochemistry rather, or anything like that. It will be a general raising of your awareness about the virtues and the potential for the HSCL molecule. The side to which I would dread giving another lecture on biochemistry or anything else, because some years ago I came across uh, a student definition of what a lecture is. Scared the pants off me. <laughs> it was in a rag mag, and the students have written down a definite of a lecture as the transfer of notes from those of the lecturer to those of the student without it entering the minds of either. <laughs> and beside that, there was another definition of a lecturer, which was even more frightening than somebody who talks in your sleep. <laughs> so what I want to do is give you a personal angle on this. And the personal angle comes together here with, um, so this is my first story. Which airline is that? Ah, yeah, sharp lot. You are amazing, that's right. Um, this story is one of initial disbelief because uh, a great leader of the whole HSL movement, Charlie Coffin, invited me many years ago, I'm not putting a date down on this because it's embarrassing, mm -hmm. uh, to go to a meeting in Geneva to talk to some scientists at Nestle who would come up with some extraordinary product that would be useful in agriculture. So Charlie and I got on a plane, went out to Geneva, had this great meeting, very positive. And uh, as we came out of the meeting, wandering through the streets of Geneva, Charlie said to me, don't worry, Hugh, I'll write up the minutes for the meeting. I thought, great. That's let me off the hook there. I said to Charlie, as we were passing this rather plush and very exotic looking chocolate cabin, I said, Charlie, I'll buy the chocolates for the people at home, okay? Because you're doing me a great favor. So I went in and bought the chocolate. So we got on the flight, but halfway through the flight back, Charlie turned to me and said, Hugh, I've, I've got this stuff. I said, what's that, Charlie? He said, it kills all bugs instantly, but it's perfectly safe to humans. Charlie, you've been in the, the, the lounge too long. You can't want to drink it again. So I said to him, Why did you get this stuff, Charlie? And he said, Russia. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. Anyway, he went through a long diatribe of, of what this stuff was. And I was too busy massaging my wallet back into life in this horrible extortion experience of going to the chocolate cabin to take too much notice. Uh, and in the end, he said, well, I'll bring some round for you, and you can test it. Okay, so Charlie used his charm on me, and I did exactly that. I received the material he brought around, and at the time, Charlie had a way of demonstrating the characteristics of HOCL. I've got some HOCL here that I made up this morning. Okay, here it is. Very carefully labeled. As you can <laughs> see. No mistakes. I'm going to put some into this glass here. This is exactly what Charlie did. Try and convince me of this stuff. And just to take a comparison, I've got a glass of water here. Actually, the ionized water. Makes sense. And he took his fountain pen. It's a very expensive pound, and I was very impressed. You put mine here. 
took it apart and dropped a drop of ink into the water. Okay, well, you all know what it's like. It's me. Yeah. Okay, the, the book color. Then he did exactly the same with a drop into HOCL solution. Two drops there just for good work. It's a bit of staring. And all the colors rudely disappear. He then did something that I'm not going to do. He stuck his finger in there and stuck it into his eye. <laughs> <laughs> and grinning at me with a teardrop of HFCL dripping down his cheek, he said, I'd be screaming if that was bleach. So he convinced me that there was something to be tested. So I said, okay, Charlie, leave some behind and I'll test it, which I did. I must admit, I was a bit flustered. I was a very busy lecturer and had lots of things to do. Uh, so I set up a little test. And we had some spare petri dishes going from a microbiological thing that was going on in the labs with some uh, general uh, brood medium in it, you know, books and microbiology things. And I tried to find a couple of dirty things around the lab. I, I had a bit of a rush. I just chose an old maze brain that had left over from demonstration stuck between the floorboards of the lab. Dirty, filthy, trampled on thing, and a piece of broken petri dish, which is in the same position, stuck them on the petri dishes, left them overnight. Can you guess what happened the next day? I was very skeptical. I came in the next day, thought, like, ah, let's take a look at those dishes. Took a look at the dishes, and they were sterile. Not the sign of anything growing at all. I was convinced. Absolutely convinced that this was uh, something special. Of course, it could have been bleach, but nevertheless, it had properties which were not quite the same. So I haven't got pictures of those uh, little trials that I did, but this is a picture which is broadly similar. It shows a petri dish with some wheat grain growing on there. And the reason why it's so misty and difficult to see is that there are threads of hyphal strands of a fungus growing in there. And little black dots and white dots are their sporulation. And you can see little patches of sort of milkiness where bacteria are growing. <clears throat> okay, so that's what you get when uh, you uh, don't do anything to clean the grain. And this is the same with uh, cereal grain, nine days after treatment, same time as the control vessel there. It's been treated with about 500 parts per million level of free chlorine of HACR. The important thing to notice here and something we investigated later on, is you've got fantastic growth in those wheat grains, but not the slightest sign of any unwanted microorganism growing with them. So that's the sort of thing that convinced me that uh, something special was happening here. That initial skepticism, strangely enough, was reflected in uh, Charlie's story of how he spoke to this chap, Joe Salcombe. Fine man, typical English gentleman, really, really nice guy, uh, who worked his career in microbiology and advised me on some of the microbiological testing that was done and gave me some very useful advice about HCL. So Charlie was introduced to him. And when Charlie says he, like everyone else, was highly skeptical, you know that he said, get out of here, this stuff won't work. And Charlie used his charm yet again for Joe to do some micro microbiological testing for him. He called Charlie after three days and said, Mr. Cocking, what is this stuff you give me? It's killing bugs faster than we can count. Mm -hmm. That was literally the truth because the contact time for hypochlorous acid to kill bugs is one of the shortest you'll find anywhere. It's rapid, it's instant. So when Charlie told me on the plane, I've got something that kills everything instantly, he was not exaggerating at all. So we embarked then with Charlie on a series of tests to take a look at how this material might be used in agriculture. So we had this circus type events going on where we tried just about everything we could get our hands on. 
If you take a carrot from the supermarket, as you might often do, stick it in a plastic bag and go back oh, 40 odd days later, it might look like something like that. Now remember that carrot has probably been dipped into sodium hypochlorite or bleach probably a couple of times, but there's still masses of microbes on it. This is a wash in sodium hypochlorite, which is just on bleach. And you can see it's done something to improve the situation. <clears throat> this is one treated with HOCL. It looks fresh as the day we put it in. Absolutely remarkable. Uh, and we did lots of tests like this, showing the benefits of a wash of vegetables uh, to the microbiology contamination surfaces of a variety of um, perishable goods. Here's some table grapes. 42 days after treatment, stored at 10 degrees C, the sort of temperature your fridge might be at. I know when my kids were home, the fridge is practically room temperature because the door was open. And most fridges, I suppose, that's the word there. 42 days after, days after treatment, stored about 10 degrees centigrade. So they are the treated ones. Here we have a water rinse, and the RO just stands for reverse osmosis. It's just our way in the lab sort of getting uh, pure water. Those are reverse osmosis water rinse. And as you can see, there is hardly any grape surviving at that point. Would you eat those? No. I've got the right answer. <laughs> Save me. Would you eat these? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Those are hypochlorous acid treated table grapes 42 days after treatment. Unbelievable, isn't it? They're absolutely clean. They've been, the surface has been sterile. You can see a little bit of a brown ring there. See that on the abscission for the for the scar that's been left behind. I I was told some time in the past, and this is one of the little things that sweep through, that that's a reaction to the sulfur dioxide that table grapes are exposed to during their transport and storage. So that's not an HOCL related factor. It's just one of those physiological damage events that take place. So I think you can see that as we went through this, we got an ever increasingly positive story about how HOCL can be used in the agricultural food industry. I couldn't miss out roses today, could I? <laughs> could I? <laughs> it's Valentine's Day, and I'm sure the ladies in the room have been on the streets of roses and some matter or another. Unfortunately, mine are white, not red, so I've missed out on the precise um, mood, I suppose, of, uh, of, of today. Why don't we test roses? Well, I don't know whether you know, but roses, when they're cut, like all cut, cut stems, have an exposed surface at the bottom of the stem. Mm. But the plant to survive needs to transport water through the stem in order to compensate the loss of the plant. It's a transpiration stream. Isn't it? Trouble is, those little water passageways, the water tubes, get blocked by bacteria. So when the water you're keeping your cut plants in goes milky, you know that the lifetime of the plant of the stem is limited. We did some work on this to see if we could overcome that barrier to rose life and humidity. And as you can see here, what we measured is the bloom diameter. And you know, roses go through. I've practiced this. Okay, I've practiced it. With. Roses grow like that to start with, then they go like that, then they go like that, and like that. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Just so well, what we did here was to measure that the bloom down is the wider the petals, the more attractive the plant, the more active it is in showing off its uh, aesthetic qualities. We have a number of lines on the top of your square here because we were looking for an optimum concentration. And those lines do go around that optimum concentration. As you can see here with the water, the bloom diameter went like that, and then it died away. Interestingly enough, um, we weighed the stems when they were going through that process. And as you can see here with water, the blue line, the transpiration rate <coughs> fell off, whereas with the HOCL optimum concentration, water use has kept on going. In fact, you know, we had to terminate the experiment because the roses were growing side shoots. <laughs> the plants didn't know 
perhaps don't know the truth of that, but the plan, the physiological reaction was that the plant was unaware, that the use out humanistically point of view, that the, the, the roots have been cut off because the HOCL prevented bacterial growth and the water just kept on flowing up the stem and kept it alive. So we could kept those plants growing almost indefinitely if you hit the right concentration. And I'm being cagey about the concentration because that still has commercial value. Okay, <laughs> I've got to be careful. And like one of the students was interested in this, so they did a little experiment of their own. And measure, after we measured wet weight, which is not so important, and you can see the HOCL concentration was the best. He mentioned uh, some uh, products that you might use for increasing stem life. And as you can see here, uh, tremendously beneficial effect from our HOCL under the name of Sterilox in that column. This is just a one shot. It wasn't repeated uh, applications of water, which is sterile in this case. So we have positive proof that that was a very useful um, application. So we were convinced that this molecule was really special. If you want to know what the molecule is like, there it is. It contains only three atoms, hydrogen, oxygen, and chlorine. It's a simple molecule. Part of its beauty as a molecule, part of its problem in being euthanized. Because I don't know whether you know that many of the disinfectants and antibiotics and things like this are highly complicated molecules, and they can be the toys of chemical engineers and changing groups around and atoms and reorientating things to get them to do the job perfectly. Not many options with three atoms in a group like this. So what exactly is a chlorous acid? Well, it only ever exists in solution. You can't get dry HOCL. It's got to be in a water and aqueous environment to do its job. So it's a mildly acidic pH 5, 6, somewhere in there, naturally occurring, okay, which is the theme I will be concentrating on intensely a little later on. A naturally occurring aqueous chlorine solution between 5 and 7. The next sentence is really important. Every creature which uses blood as its life support system carries HOCL or the potential to produce HOCL in its blood cells. Gives you a clue, really, a bit of a clue, not the obvious clue that it's natural and therefore you know, beneficial. Gives you a clue that this must have evolved some time long ago, along with the other physiological systems that go along with it. And that, I think, is an important thing to consider. It's not just natural, it's a part of our evolutionary process to have this chemical inside us. And everyone in the has HSL being things inside you invisibly without any harm. So HSL is a remarkable biocide, we call it that, eradicating in seconds, as we found out, even the toughest um, opponents that we'll find in the microbiological world like Clostridium difficile spores, mycobacteria, fungi, and viruses, including COVID-19, the virus. Okay, that's, that's an important aspect for us. So HLCL has the potential to use in personal hygiene. I use it for that. You know, why criticize me for not being Italian for HLCL? Um, clinical environments, that's for sure. Food production and environmental management. So it has a multiplicity of uses. Where did it come from? This is a fine looking chap, isn't it? <laughs> My goodness me. Scientists knew how to look in the day, and they're ever so important to distinguish the French chap, uh, Antoine Jerome Ballard. There is a metro station in Paris named after him. Anybody been there? No? Well, watch out for it next time you're circulating around Paris. Um, he uh, fiddled around with chemicals and produced HSCL. That's a bad part of the story, really. But he's a distinguished person because Louis Pasteur was one of his pupils. And this guy helped design the experiment that discredited the spontaneous creation of life. So he's quite a character. He did a great job for us in discovering that. But the use of HOCL externally goes back to 1915. Incredible, isn't it? And here's a, an extract from the 
British Medical Journal at that time uh, on the antiseptic action of hypochlorous acid in this application to wound treatment. I was staggered when I found this. I thought, how can a material like this be discovered so long ago, yet we're largely, we as a community, I'm not accusing anybody of being ignorant, we as a community don't use it so much as we should. And medical uses, the benefits were recognized in 1916. Um, um, and the statement here is really important. The efficient antiseptic is one which, while it exerts its antiseptic action, does not devitalize body tissues. Very posh way of saying it doesn't damage you. Like that, really. And it seemed to us that is the author of the paper that in hypochlorous acid solution, which is then called USOL, we have as near as possible the ideal antiseptic. I think that's still true today. Things have not changed. The one drawback I'll put down in the final statement here, sadly, it wasn't a chemically stable solution. It degraded itself very rapidly, half life of 24 hours and thereabouts, so you couldn't predict its action when it had been stored. What a tragedy. What an awful thing to deal with. You've got the perfect chemical to use in dire circumstances, but you can't actually use it because it doesn't stay in its chemical original form. So here's a bit of biology for you. It's not meant to be a biology lesson, but this is fundamental to uh, how hydrochlorous acid behaves in us. Okay. This is a little slide I use for undergraduate teaching. It's meant to represent the cross-section of uh, what white blood cell they neutrophil in this case, which is responsible for eating up microbes in our system. What we get here is the formation of little pockets of membrane-bound material. They're called lysosomes. Lyso break down the cell in the body. These are materials which contain the enzymes or the progressive enzymes which can break things down. When a bacterium or a foreign body is ingested, this lysosome combines with the endocytotic inclusion and destroys the bacterium or whatever it is getting in and then spits out the remainder. Okay, brilliant system. Bear that in mind when we go through further in our work. This is the, the location, the geography, if you like, of where HOCL comes into play. HOCL does not get produced until we get those phagal lysosomes in action. There's another bit of biochemistry for you, but it's important for us to um, familiarize ourselves with the sort of processes going on here. In that phagal lysosome membrane, we get of the engulfed microbe, we get certain reactions taking place. You can see here that our HOCL in red there is formed by several enzymes. Uh, one important one, which is minor peroxidase, MPO, uh, which acts on hydrogen peroxide, H2O2, to form HOCL. That's not academic knowledge. That will come in useful to us a little later on. Okay, So I'm not giving you anything in your mind that is superfluous to work. This is of central importance to us. Some individuals have one of these enzymes deficient in their bodies. The NADPH oxidase there. And without that enzyme, HSCL can reproduce. What's the consequences of that? This. You can't have a lecture without having a gory picture in it. <laughs> <laughs> and this poor, poor soul is suffering from uh, chronic granulosis disease. It's repeated infections of fungi in susceptible areas of the body because they don't have a high hydrochloric acid there to kill off that invading organism. That is the most pictorially gruesome picture I could find of the consequences of not having HLCL in your body. But it also raises another very important thing here, which I'll refer to again later on during the lecture. But this process of forming these oxidizing compounds that result in the death of the organism by ripping it apart, by burning it up by oxidation, is called an oxidative burst. And that's a really important thing that takes place in the body when the body is being attacked by microbes. An oxidative burst, you get this huge number 
of powerfully degrading material occupants to release in the body that bring about resolve of the uh, infection. Okay, so HOCL, it's a bit of a Goldilocks molecule, isn't it? I mean, everything's just right, okay? It's the right size. Three atoms, it's very small. It can get into places and across membranes where other molecules might not be able to. It's got no charge on it. So that means the negative charge that are on microbes you know, results in this material being able to contact them. It oxidizes them, it's in the right oxidation state, and it evolved with us. Okay, it's our partner in our immune system. How do we get HOCL? Well, man made HOCL comes in various ways. There are a variety of techniques, but you will all have used HOCL in your house, I will bet, at some time in the past, because it is the main biocide of bleach. Okay. But the form of the biocide you get in the bleach is strongly dependent on the alkaline acid balance of its environment. It shows it here. NaOCl is sodium hypochlorite. Okay, that's bleach. And when the pH is below 7.5, when it's being diluted, you get HOCl produced. When it's above 7.5, when it's above the point of neutrality, you get the hypochlorite ion formed instead. The thing here is that the HOCl is between 80 and 100 times more biocidal than the hypochlorite ion. What a difference that makes. It is an immense difference. It's a measurable difference that we can across. Here's a dissociation curve. Now, as you can see, as the pH goes up, so we get a switch over from the hypochlorite ion at low pH to the dominant form of the um, hypochlorous acid atom. Both of these are called available free chlorine. They're available to react. They can undergo reactions that hopefully result in the demise of whatever object they're attacking. So below seven, essentially, you've got a dominance of hypochlorous acid, above seven, the dominance of the hypochlorite ion. So you might think that because of this difference, going from a molecular solution, HSCL, which penetrates cells, to an ionic solution of polar penetration, we could make up HMCL purely from bleach. But note that bleach comes in a form which is not pH neutral. It's supplied with sodium hydroxide, which keeps the pH high and makes the bleach solution stable. So although the HMCL is potentially there, it's unavailable to us unless you take the daring length of adding acid cleaner to bleach. Get your domestos out, get your acid cleaner out, and what do you get? Chlorine, well spotted. Just uh, 50 yards away from us here, when I was teaching one time, some poor janitorial assistant did exactly this. Mm -hmm. and was cutted off the hospital with a dire state of being unable to breathe because its lungs were full of chlorine developing hydrochloric acid, and that's a pretty horrible consequence. So although you can buy bleach, you can potential lots of HCL, you can't get to it. It's very, very dangerous, and you're quite right you said, because if you do that, if you don't get the pH precisely right, you're going to screw up and pay, pay the cost. Well, what this has brought about is a terrible state of confusion between HCL and bleach. And it's been to the detriment of the use of HOCL. There's a paper being published recently by uh, Felicity Mandali here. I've listed on here, and Re uh, Clayton Home and Reynolds, um, who make that case very clearly, distinguish the difference between them. But even the World, World Health Organization gets it wrong. In their assessment of HOCL as a potential use for COVID. And 19 control. They referred to the experience of workers 
uh, madly trying to prevent an Ebola virus epidemic. We spent hours in the back of a van driving to the location to spray bleach and coming back with their shirts and overalls soaked in real bleach. And they decided on the basis of that that we couldn't possibly use HOCL. Ah, would you believe it? And you can see my account of that on the HOCL Trust website. So things can get wrong. Even the medical profession can get it wrong. This is a slide from a medical profession tutorial tool. Can you see the error? Give you a clue, it's outlined in red. Okay, <laughs> there it is. They called HOCL bleach. Oh, no, it's not bleach. It's anything but bleach. It's a totally different molecule and has a totally different behavior. You can imagine my frustration coming out of it, isn't it, really, in this, this whole business of confusion. It permeates um, all sorts of errors which you think would be more able to make a distinction between them. Okay, so that's just one way of getting HSCL. The other way is by electrolysis. And this is the Russian technology that Charlie referred to in that initial conversation I had with him. The Russians were very deep into electrochemistry. They used it for all sorts of applications and industrial purposes. And one of them was the development of a, a, a continuous system of making hypochlorous acid. They simply took dilute brine, as you said, the salt solution, passed it through two electrodes, uh, one an anode, one a cathode, one anode, one a cathode. And the output was uh, from the anode, which is called the analyte, which is superoxidized water. You would come across that name again, which contained HFCL. And the other one, the catalyte, which is very slimy and as you expect an alkaline material to be, it contained a uh, sodium hydroxide solution, which was dumped. So that's one way, electrolysis. Electrolysis comes in various forms, some very crude and some very, very pure process can be produced here. This doesn't imply any degree of quality control, which is vital in some applications for getting HOCL correct. HOCL generators by electrolysis started out like this. This is a Russian model. <coughs> Pretty cool, eh? Hey? You have one of these around, you were at the top when it comes to generating HOCL. And notice the battery charger. That's all it is. And the internals look like this. Deceptive, really, because those two titanium electrodes actually contain <laughs> a very uh, important coating of um, rare earth elements, which improve the electrolysis process. So that looks crude and very well. Well, Charlie got involved to the extent of producing lots of these machines for cleaning endoscopes. Mm. And at one time, I declared to my family that if I ever needed endoscopy, which thank goodness I have it, don't ever put me into a hospital which didn't have mm. hypochlorous yes. acid as the plan. I don't know whether you, some of you will know endoscopy quite well. Um, it gets stuck into all sorts of holes, doesn't it, within the body? So yeah. not too clean. Uh, so, uh, but the, the, the importance for hospitals to get use of the endoscope as much as possible. Um, and so the turnaround is, is really important. So they take the endoscope out and give it what's called a social wash first, okay? get rid of the big bits. And then it was put into uh, disinfectants based around paracetic acid and glutaraldehyde. Not, yeah, not only did they not do the job well, it was making nurses go ill and leave the profession. Never happened in the case of emergency. So this is the sort of machine which um, did that much better job. And because it was unstable, it had to be regulated. So the amount being taken out of the machine was recorded. Uh, the pH and the um, redox potential of the material was measured and its AFC and all these quality control criteria. But there's an even easier way of producing HOCL. You're probably wondering what these tubs are like here, right? This is a product called uh, NADCC, which comes in tablet form. This. There it is little solid white tablet, drop that into a litre of water, 
And within five or 10 minutes, you get a solution of about 1,000 parts per million of hydrochloric acid, which is far stronger than you need for most applications. Okay, but it won't damage your skin at that moment, even though it's incredibly biocidal. Charlie said it was true, even in tablet form. Now, this you wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't touch this too much. You certainly wouldn't put it in your mouth. Fortunately, I know somebody who did. Tell you about that as we go along. One peculiar thing about NADCC is that when it dissolves, it's not totally converted to hydrochloric acid. There is some chlorine which remains part of the intact molecule, which is only released when some of the chlorine is used up by reaction with whatever thing you're treating. So we'll find that NADCC is very good for having us, I'll put in quotation marks, reserve chlorine properties. So it's more active than bleach because it contains that capacity to overcome um, residues of, of organic materials which soak up the oxidizing power of hydrochloric acid. What is NADCC? There it is, sodium dichloroisocyanurate. Bit of a mouthful, so that's why we call it NADCC. Uh, it's also a fairly simple molecule. You can get them into lots of brand names. Those are tablets, give you an idea of the size of them. They are the best, so they break up and disperse quite quickly. And they're not very toxic. The lethal dose 50%, that's the amount that would give you 50% chance of dying. It's about 700 milligrams of the of course, of the NADCC per kilogram of body weight about 49 grams, about 30 of these tablets. And take it from me, um, uh, they don't taste nice. <laughs> I'll leave out the bit of that organic load because it's time with us. Oh, have I done 45 minutes already? <sighs> no. Okay, how long have I got? We started late. We started late. Yeah, we started late. Okay, right here. Yeah. Um, so the case I'm making is that NADCC is safer than bleach. Um, certainly the fumes that come off are less than bleach, so you're safer in that respect. Funny thing is, I've discovered in Spain, anybody know about the dishwashing habits of Spaniards? I thought I'd ask. Um, apparently, when doing the washing up, it's quite common to sprinkle bleach into the washing up solution. And so they get a lot of cases of chlorine damaging people. Uh, as a result of that, you wouldn't get it with HSCL. And deliberate ingestion with bleach, of course, is the way individuals sadly committing suicide. Mm -hmm. um, but it would take a lot of these tablets to do that. Uh, there's, a, there's a case I've listened here of somebody who took 11 grams of NADCC tablets, about eight tablets, but was able to survive. Okay, And the person I knew who mistook one of these tablets for a vitamin tablet, Okay. It landed on the tongue. Immediately it was spat out because the taste was absolutely repulsive. And it lingered in this horrible state in the mouth for some considerable time. However, I must speed up. There are other products from HOCL called sodium oxychloroquine, uh, chlorpractin, which is a sort of slow release thing. We might come across it. So that's another form. I'll leave that. Uh, HSCL is safety. It's really important because Charlie said it's completely safe to keep it, right? So that's what we must concentrate on. Um, HSCL is picked up by substances in the body, mucus, epithelial cells, proteins. They all reduce the power of HSCL. So antioxidants, you might recognize some of these lycopene, you get the tomatoes, melatonin, ascorbic acid, uh, vitamin C, beta carotene, moderate the toxicity of HOCL. So we have built-in defenses in our body. So with both specific HOCL destructive agents like those and absorption by body tissues and secretions, the human body is protected by two levels of protection against HOCL, thus rendering it safe. So it's the dose which counts, yeah? Everything is dose dependent, isn't it? In the immune reaction, that exposure of the microbe to HOCL is contained in that peculiar thing called a phagolysogen. It's in a little compartment, and that's where HOCL can be concentrated and do its business. So biology, our evolution, 
<coughs> has produced a circumstance in which the effects of HSL are maximized by that. Clever, isn't it? Mm. Very really clever, I would say. Mm. Isn't evolution wonderful? Remarkable, remarkable. And one other material which saps up HSL is taurine. Anybody familiar with taurine? Yes. Where does it come from? Bulls. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Red Bull. Correct. <laughs> yeah. All mother's milk. Yeah. You know, mother's milk being advocated. That's rich in taurine too. So Red Bull in the morning after rough night probably gets rid of all that inflammation process. And interesting enough, after chlorination by taurine, after all these people mopping up, taurine actually becomes a healing agent. What? You mean you get healing after killing? Yes, you do. You get this remarkable reaction that enables the tissues to recover because HSL has been used. Isn't that amazing? Mm -hmm. a, little, a little fact I wasn't going to introduce. Who's ever used salt for getting with an infection on a wound? One hand going up, two, three, four. Yeah, going up with the face. Why? Why do you use salt? Yes, it's how does it work? It does, that's right. I always thought that like food preservation, it sucks water out of micro. Yeah, yeah there's that, but it doesn't. It provides a rich source of chloride on it. And what does myelin peroxidase test on water preservation? What does myelin peroxidase need to make? Have chlorous acid from hydrogen peroxide, chlorine. chlorine. Okay, mm -hmm. so when you put salt in a wound, you're enhancing the amount of hypochlorous acid being generated. Old wives' tale, maybe you put salt in a wound, it's generating hypochlorous acid. So, what we do with microbes is that we give them a massive dose of HSL, whether that's in a bag of lysosome or whether it's we're using it as disinfectant. And it overwhelms the defensive characteristics of the microbe. So it's very unlikely for resistance to arise. So in short, HOCL can be described as being safe. There's no caustic chemistry. When you take HOCL, you won't get your upper gastrointestinal tract destroyed. It's absorbed quickly and exhausted by reaction with the superficial surfaces of the body, and we have natural antioxidant defenses as well. And solutions up to a thousand ppm. Exactly what was in this tub here are completely harmless in the human body. That's why Charlie escaped being blinded by this stuff as he splashed it into his eye. For chronic conditions, your amount of HL cell scavenging may be kept on your diet. And it's the Mediterranean plant-based diet, which has been proved to be excellent in that respect. Antibiotics, we haven't got much time. Antibiotics, let's go through these. We've all used antibiotics surely at one time or another, and particularly skin applied antibiotics. Antibiotics can be highly allergenic, not so in HSCL. They can be effective against, ineffective against resistant bacteria. The big fright, isn't it? We get resistance to them. Not with HSCL, it's effective against those. Delay healing with antibiotics. Yes, you get delayed healing with antibiotics, people. Are. You do it with HSCL. Some are not antibiotics, not safe around eyes and ears, safe with HNCL. There are limits to how long you can use an antibiotic for. No limits with HNCL. You can't use antibiotics for preventative use. You can with HNCL. There are multiple side effects with antibiotics. No side effects with HNCL. And of course, antibiotic use causes resistance, even if you've never had a resistant organism exposure before. Resistance is highly unlikely in HSCL. Okay, let's move on to viruses. We know that HSCL kills the viruses of SARS CoV 2. It kills COVID 19. They also, it also kills prions. Isn't that amazing? These peculiar proteins that hold up and cause plaques in the brain and cause degenerative disease. Can be killed by HCL when it's used in massive pressure and autoclaving required to do it normally. No, you take yes. You could say that our dear friend Mr. Trump had a point. He <laughs> 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 mentioned bleach. Hold, hold, <laughs> hold on to that point, please. <laughs> hold back. Hold back the way. Yeah, <laughs> I can't wait to get there. I'm going to take a touch. 
Um, water purification, the HOCL trust perusing, we've a bit the HOCL trust for hygiene and safe water. In short, uh, we found in a study in 1998 that HOCL controls cholera and typhoid fever down to a level 0.5 ppm HOCL, next to nothing. It's below the limits of the WHO for ingestion of drinking water. You would notice by taste and smell. Amazing. Amazing results. But getting HOCL to where it's needed is a really significant challenge. Targeting. Okay? This is a bit of a flippant thing. Somebody's devised an electrochemical bandage. You put the bandage on, you apply a voltage, and you get HOCL produced. I think that's remarkable. Name me an antibiotic you can produce on site like that. There isn't. There's a product called E101, which takes the enzymes that make HOCL, okay, I mentioned before, and puts them in an aqueous base that you can put on a root. So you're actually applying your own biological system intensely. I don't know why I'm using my arm, but anyway, it might be injured. You can put it right on that injury and get a good response from it. A localized biological generation of HOCL. Which brings us to targeting as far as the misting operation is concerned. Now, misting was investigated as a means of producing a microbiocidal atmosphere many years ago. In this case, we're looking at the possible deleterious effects of virus and bug transmission in the air shelters of World War II, and it worked. Today, we have a great fear of misting HOCL. You might have read in the newspapers during all that madness of the pandemic of what was going on. It works for the reasons that I just explained. Wound healing is, of course, very important. My thanks go to Ross Walker, who's here in the audience today. John's pointing out. Okay, he's here. Uh, wound healing is exceptional property of HOCR. Look at this wound here. It's a long-term, two-year, non-healing ulcer. Imagine being face life with that stuck permanently on your leg. Horrible, isn't it? Ten days after the use of Finisette, this is the result. Amazing. Isn't that truly life-changing for that person? To have a recovery after two years of misery with a wound like that. More than just disinfection? Yeah. Damn right we get more than just disinfection with HSCR. I'm going to miss out these slides because I noticed that when we treated plants, seeds with HSCR, for disinfection purposes, they grew faster. And this is the seedling length of onions treated 14, 14 days after treatment treated with water and HSCL, and the results I didn't expect. Why should you be doing something like this? It shouldn't happen. And then my second story, and we're coming to the end of the, the lecture there, but hold on. The story of the two spotted spider mice, because Charlie came along to me one week and said, Hugh, can we kill insects with this? So I said, so likely, Charlie. Insects have got a big cuticle, and water repellent, they're quite large. Oh, I said, give it a go anyway. So I said, all right, Charlie, I'll try it on mice. They're not insects, of course. Well, they can smite, hence the name. I'll give it a go. So we sprayed these mice, because long story short, with doses of HOCR, they live longer. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. <laughs> mice like HOCR. But we noticed something. We looked at their emergence. You, know, you go and leave this, you put the female on it for 24 hours, lay eggs, and then you can spray stuff onto the eggs. They started emerging in proportion to the amount of HOCL they've been given. What? This is real after 60. I went back the next day just to check on that. Exactly the same. And then I discovered that HOCL is one of those substances that's produced in the reactive oxygen. Burst. Remember that? Yeah. The oxidation burst, and that happens during life stage changes. Life stage changes are huge changes in physiology and anatomy 
in processes like the seed germinating, okay, still there, and emergence from the egg, okay, because there's a radical change in body function properties. And this was producing an earlier emergence. It gave me the clue that HS cell is doing more than just killing bugs without a doubt. I was going to ask the audience of what could the possible connection be between Donald Trump and HSL. I do apologize. Yeah. <laughs> there he is on the 24th of April 2020. Bless him. He did his best, didn't he? <laughs> to convey that there is potential in using a disinfectant by injection. What? The whole <laughs> media blew up at that point. Of explosion of disdain and ridiculous suggestions. BBC made a good job of it. Um, they got hold of John Barnes, a pulmonologist, that Zuckerberg sent them, that sounds very impressive, doesn't it? And he said, even breathing fumes from bleach could cause severe health problems. Damn right, damn right it does. He said that inhaling chlorine bleach would be absolutely the worst thing for lungs. Well, I can imagine snorting concentrated sulfuric acid might be just, <laughs> but it was pretty close. Not even a low dilution of bleach is safe. Correct. It's a totally ridiculous concept. Correct, isn't it? Absolutely correct. Because poor old Donald Trump was trying to talk about HLCL. Okay. And this culminated for me in a publication uh, called, the, I call it the Kalima study. Kalima is a region of Mexico where this really impressive investigation was carried out. The study took patients who were already suffering from COVID-19 and treated them with escalating doses of HFCL, either through nebulized form, that is breathing in a mist, okay, or by direct injection. I couldn't believe the results when they came through. What I've done is to hike something out of the, uh, the paper, and this sort of summarizes it. It was a third size group. There were over 100 in both the experimental and control groups. And they measured the days until PASS, patient acceptable symptom state. So they felt better, basically. And as you can see in the experimental hypochlorous acid treated group, much earlier. And statisticians love the figures on the right hand side there. Mm -hmm. Anything less than 0 0.05 is regarded as due to the treatment, not just random events that cause differences. 0 0.001 is as good as it gets. Okay, mm -hmm. definite outcome. Uh, the pass on day five is just a measure of recovery, highly significant. Hospitalized, much lower in the experimental group. Days to be hospitalized and death strongly affected by HOCL. Isn't that amazing? But the most sensible thing about this paper is that they came up with a mechanism by which this process works. I won't go into the detail because it's the end of the lecture, but I would just point out that it has both a systemic effect, probably related to the evolutionary process of using hypochlorous acid as a mediator of the immune system, and a direct effect on the viruses, both of which contributed toward the recovery. Why, I ask, wasn't this investigated? Mm. I think it's an outright near criminal act to behave in the way things have gone. And I asked myself the question, where are the scientists explaining this? Where are they? Are they hiding? I know a part of it is because the authors of that paper didn't want to say they were using hypochlorous acid. In the paper, they referred to superoxidized water. Remember that description? Mm -hmm. And unknowingly, I was doing some consulting to the company who supplied the stuff in the first place. And even I didn't know about it. It was all going on public and secret. They were almost frightened of the reaction they would get, I believe, mm -hmm. if this went wide, publicly too wide. So there we are. Okay. Thank you for your patience in getting through all of that. Have I raised your awareness about HSCL? Yes. Um, Have I given you something to think about on the way home? Yes. Brilliant. That's all I have to say. Thank you very much for your time.
That's good. Yeah. So what we've actually you sort of curtailed quite a bit from the presentation because what we really wanted to lead on to was the attitude of government and pharma suitable companies mm -hmm. towards this material. Because as you've heard, it doesn't have very many shortcomings and a heck of a lot to, to, to promote it. So you know, what, what are the issues that upset its development? Well, one of, I would put it to you that it's probably price is one. It is too cheap. Yeah. Pharmaceutical companies only get excited when they can pour lots of money into it, make complicated molecules, put it through a big regulatory process and charge a lot. But this is too cheap. Then you've got, it's not patentable. So you can't make any money out of it because it actually exists. And that upsets people. The stability issue is another one. Now, there are quite a few companies in that are actually producing it uh, and finding ways of producing it to improve its shelf life. But as you can see, it does need really need to be produced locally and on site. And that can be an issue. And that's why in hospitals, it had to be produced on, on site. So the next one, and this was particularly the case when we were trying to promote its use during the COVID period, was quite skeptical amongst the regulators. And they were resistant to stick their heads above the parapet. It got passed between the HSE and NHS. The NHS said they couldn't use it because it wasn't approved by the HSC. The HSC said, well, we haven't had any. And all they wanted were big dossiers proving, the, proving it. And the fact that there's a limited amount of information because that research that has been done has been done and funded by the public domain and not by uh, the bigger sources of money. So the sceptical regulators is really one. And with that, that sort of led to, well, I put it, lazy and incompetent government. So how do we get this message across? Well, one thing that occurred to me was, why aren't we looking at it for sepsis? Mm -hmm. What a small amount of money that it would cost to, to try and test that out? I just don't know. And then you've got the, the charities. We've had a, improving the drinkability, the, the possibility of water in emergency situations. You know, if you, could, if you can filter out the particulate rubbish and then treat the water with HOCL, you have something which is drinkable and not going to kill you. So why aren't we shipping that out to emergency situations or to the third world? You know, we spoke to WaterAid, we pestered them to say, you know, get real, let's, that's what you're supposed to do, isn't it? They're more interested in producing standpipes and sticking them up in, in the middle of nowhere to get clean water. Well, that's fine in the longer term, but in the short term. So why, where, where's this skepticism? And how, so I put it to you. One other fact you didn't mention, which I was quite surprised when you mentioned ESOL. Yeah. It's, that is what USOL is purely and simply because USOL is well known in medical circles. I think it's a, a euphemism. That it's got it's a natural. It's become a generic term. Embry University solution of Lysol. And it's, I think, generally, back to my mind, a weak, a weak disinfectant supremacy. Mm. And is that's it, perception. It was the stability issue, which yeah, I can was the difficulty, that. the big yeah. barrier yeah. to. to, mm. to and also, the, uh, if it is light something, light something that sounds very nice. I'll show you this one. Your, your previous slide said, Where are the scientists? Yeah. And I think in your quest to get an innovation adopted, you asked the wrong question. You've probably got plenty of scientists, but you don't have any, many marketeers. Mm -hmm. And if you do a study on how innovation is getting into populations, and there are quite a few of these studies, you, it's not about having a good product. The marketing is important. Mm. And looking at how marketeers get innovations in isn't obvious for scientists. And I think you should take, have a look at that. But the pharmaceutical companies spend a huge amount of money with marketing. Mm. It's not enough to get a good product. They market them. And it's not, it's a, it's a problem in scientific circles. Marketing has a bad 
smell that. But actually, I think that's part of your problem. You find the lead doctor, you 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 find the change change agents, and you will find it to take off. If it's if it's good, it will take off. But it doesn't matter how good your product is, you've got to market it in some way. If you know selling commercial marketing, you've got to market it. Look at how marketeers work. Yeah. The uh, the history of HSL is scattered with the uh, companies that have gone under, thinking this would be the, the way to make money. Uh, look at how American grain farmers adopt, adopt, um, took on new grains. It wasn't by, wasn't by the sales guys going out saying this is a great product. They did it a different way. Look at how scurvy was uh, cured by lime juice. It wasn't. It took a long time for that to happen, even though people recognised its efficacy. It, it's look at how marketing is done. I think one of the problems is confusion between hydrochloric acid and hydrochloric If you use the example of Donald Trump, if he just said hydrochloric acid instead of bleach, you probably heard a different result. Yeah. Okay. Yes, he mentioned it fairly early as well, before the before the preprint paper was out. Um, he's not the most erudite. <laughs> <laughs> So that and I, gives it I suspect its scientific background is minimal. <laughs> I think 1% of the American state legislature has a qualification in science. We do rather better in Parliament, 5%. Um, so when I'm saying we're the scientists, he should have been being advised on that by people who knew better. I think the scientists will be probably sitting to me right because the expression on the face yeah. absolutely <laughs> brass. Mm -hmm. okay. I'll go back yeah. and look at the video. It's worth looking at the video. Yeah. Yeah. Well, why was there no correction? Did anyone correct Trump? <laughs> 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 oh. Yeah. Uh, you didn't mention DNA, which really is in danger of being oxidized. I'm not really sure which one. Yes. Um, yeah. In the uh, lysozyme, the uh, obviously everything is protected, so it's dealt with locally. But of course, when we're applying it topically to skin, it's not going to protect. So I would have thought of it as not only wiping out the skin like fire, but it would also be damaging. Yeah, I mean, if you take a look at the literature, you'll find HSL is implicated in the inflammatory responses and damage to the system. That's right, because it's part of an immune reaction which causes inflammation. But I think the limited period over which that exposure takes place, the therapeutic value is far greater than the likelihood of causing damage. So perhaps the instability is actually an asset. Yes, I think it's a. Yeah, instability is built into a system because there are molecules specially designed to mop it up and to clear up after the uh, HSL is taken into the other question is, what was it doing in the AIDS test as far as being mutagenic? I've never seen a report of any mutagenicity at all associated with HSL. It will damage. Yes, one of the targets that uh, it shreds up in the oxidation process is DNA and RNA. So you'd it's expect some damage. That's right. So you can't have a product which kills without doing some degree of damage. I don't it's, it's it, what it would do to me. Yeah, I don't think that, I've never seen any report of any damage to tissue in any way from its use topically. Uh, yeah. Do you, do you think it's appropriate for me to break down when you do a commercial update? Do you from a, uh, from a manufacturer? Go ahead. It's not from me. Yeah. Um, can you speak up? Good, e good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I, I, uh, I represent a company that is a manufacturer of hydrochlorics, um, the brand name being Finisep, which you referred to earlier. Yeah. And uh, I think for your interest, you're obviously a very well-informed audience, so I'm, I'm not going to attempt to, 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 to better any of the science that Hugh has covered this evening, which is tremendous. But I think it, it may be relevant to explain to you that um, uh, as you and Chris have said, it is absolutely true that you know, the, the hypochlorous history is scattered with the bones of companies that have, that have attempted to bring the product to market. Um, I hope this isn't the kiss of death, but we are, we are one of those that is succeeding um, so far um, in the journey that we are, we are continuing to pedal, which is uh, we actually started in the, uh, in the ear piercing sector, as banal as that sounds, but a tremendous application. Um, and, and then we moved on to the aesthetic sector in 2017, and then the podiatry sector. Um, uh, we also have a dental mouthwash and, and the beauty sector as well. We are, they are small sectors, but we are, we are now at the stage whereby um, if any of you go to the podiatrist nowadays, 
uh, and they are not using Finisept, you're probably in the wrong podiatrist because it is that universally used as a product of that. It's also used very extensively um, in, in cosmetic surgery, aesthetic, aesthetic surgery, anything sort of um, nephroplasty, like boob drops, etc. you name it. And it's increasingly in use in the, in the NHS now, in, um, in private, uh, as, well, as well as NHS hospitals. So it is readily available, and uh, we have a stability of a two-year shelf life, yes, um, which is which is tremendous for well, as you yeah. said, in its natural form, it's somewhat unstable to the extent of not even being able to be put in the bottle. Mm -hmm. um, and it is my, I suppose, I suppose I feel um, that Charlie was well known to me, and as to, as to Hugh, uh, we are collectively taking on the the mantle of trying to bring it to. To the, the, the full benefit that it has the potential to deliver. Thank you, Ross. It's really useful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, stability is a, is a problem. And so I put it in the wrong bottle because it's, mm -hmm. it's, this is subject to UV light breakdown. Sorry. Yes. You're saying it's unstable, but is it unstable in that form in those tablets? No, as long as, long so, as it, well, with any chemical, you deteriorate over time. It's got so as long as, as long as it's sealed an and moisture is not going yeah. to get in there, it will last years. So that's probably one of its disadvantages that it's unstable. Well, oh yes, yeah, in the two, two year, two year, yeah. We, have, yeah. we have a two year shelf life, no more than a ten percent decay over that two years. Oh, it's right. perfectly viable. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's not as disastrous as that. Yeah. Uh, Penn uh, is with a company who produces a very high pure form of the uh, HACR. And that's the key to stability uh, on that the other forms. But even that superoxidized water um, paper by the, on the CLIMA study mentioned that the superoxidized water contains not only HOCl but hydrogen peroxide and hydrogen and very OCL as well, high chloride iron. So they're not saying it's entirely HOCl, but between you and me, it is. That's the dominant biocide. So you do get a variety of substances produced in the electrochemical way, but unless it's produced with a high degree of, of care and precision increase, then it becomes a purer product and more stable. Well, back to the marketing point, mm -hmm. what do you think about using great social media? Well, well, I think it's a bit of a double-edged The success yeah. comes when uh, it's the equivalent of if you're selling when they were selling uh, new grain pipes to the American grain farmers, they found the farmer who would adopt it. And then his neighboring farmer would look over the hedge and say, Yeah, I'll have some of that. But he wouldn't buy it for himself. And it's, I mean, I'm not a marketeer, I'm actually a scientist, but I, yeah. I, I think that a professional marketeer, I mean, if you've got a commercial company looking at it and selling it, they, they, are probably, they must be doing their marketing. So, and they would know how to do that. I think that, that seems to me if the product's good. It, they need the market. You don't yeah. want the market to the general public because you need to know it. You need to know it. Because of that trump statement, because the general public is slightly wrong. Yeah. And then you yeah, end yeah. it up with some rejecting routine. So yeah. uh, too subtle for most. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, uh, I'm someone who's worked both as a scientist and a marketer. So, right. Um, <laughs> uh, at quite high level in both uh, situations. Um, and yes, there is generally a, a lack of understanding among engineering and science about what marketing is and what it does and what it can do. And I see that really as being the clear signs of behavior change in marketing. Mm -hmm. and in that what you're trying to do is change behavior. You've got to work out where you change the behavior. Mm -hmm. And my sort of approach is I'm, I'm working on several sort of situations with uh, cancer treatment. And um, so much of the pharmaceutical industry is geared towards marketing and developing the content for marketing, mm -hmm. which is funding trials on a big scale. Um, now, I work as a cancer patient advocate in uh, all kinds of organizations, pharmaceutical and, and academic and so on. Things. And, with things like this, and we come across things like this quite a lot, there's no interest from the pharmaceutical whatsoever. And uh, which is this from the point of view that they're not going to fund big trials. 
but it is an advantage in my point of view is that you don't need to do the pharmaceutical trials, mm -hmm. which cost a lot of money and really are very questionable in a lot of ways. And really, mm -hmm. um, something like this, I would really be looking like the lady down there said, with small trials run by practitioners who can sort of benefit. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so that is really academic. Um, and in this in this field, academics, you know, you've got practicing academics, clinicians who are also peddling yeah. that sort of thing. They're the ones who uh, can actually um, run a small trial, uh, get something moving, and it's amazing what can happen. And uh, you know, that that's. Uh, um, I'm, I'm sort of next week. I'm on a, a meeting for the just such a trial, small trial. We've got a professor in London, uh, a, a, a funding organisation in Bristol, and I'm the mediator. I'm the, I'm the patient advocate who says this is beneficial to patients. <laughs> and if you've got, and I was thinking, I was looking at the leg ulcers, and I was thinking that could be so patient-driven research. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that would be a very strong case for patient-driven research, particularly knowing that I've got a, a neighbour, she's 94, and she went to the hospital two weeks ago, she fell over, she can't do anything because she's got ulcers on the soles of her feet. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and they, they're just not in the gym. And I can see her not going back home, you know, because of that situation. There's also been growing for years, you know, as we know. So, uh, you know, I can really see a patient driven case for it. How big is the um, safety database kind of thing? This is humans. Is there a lot of information about our safety? Yes, look at this one. Huge. Yeah, huge. <clears throat> Not in the form that you know why the regulators are. Uh, well, they don't go correctly. They just say we want evidence of this, this, and this, but they refuse to give us the protocols by which they accept the uh, the data. Can you believe it? No. Yeah. Mm -hmm. not I, I, it's it's disappointing. I, I, I want to just emphasize the difficulty at this stage because it, you know you, it seems like there are various mechanisms you can use to get to where you want to. And I spoke to NHS Improvements, a senior person at NHS Improvement. A half an hour going through the virtues of HSL sounded great. Comes back the next time, she said, We won't be going ahead with it. I said, Why? Because, she, and she said, It doesn't work. And I said, How do you know that? I was told by somebody, she said. I said, Who? She said, Another government department. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. When, when you hear stories like that, you realize the wall is much bigger. Than you might first imagine. How about doing a television program? Look what yeah. happened with the television. <laughs> 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 no, I'm serious. I mean, why not, why not uh, put this? Because, uh, well, it's been amongst our agenda of things to do, hasn't it? Yeah. Of, of really pushing the boat out and making it a popular science topic. Yeah. Unfortunately, science topics on TV yeah. don't get done mm. unless it has some popularity. I know of it. I do think you have quite a, an argument using social media to yeah. the right way. Yeah. You're not taught the right ways on the wrong age. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. TikTok and YouTube, etc. Yeah. Yeah. For the younger generation who I can't see old artificial boys that you know, yeah. experts yeah. like to put up. I've been battling that in the country for years. Mm -hmm. and you, find, you have to find an alternative way around. Yeah. You have to be very careful with that. Uh, don't you? If you look at Michael Mosley's yeah. uh, many productions, which are great, and if he goes through all the stuff on TikTok, most of it, the trouble is, most of it's we don't believe at all, and that is confidence in the, in the message. Our mission, as it stands at the moment in the HOCL Trust, is to give unbiased, scientifically sound information. That's at the very heart of what we're doing. It's a tough task because you have to go through a lot of papers, but we believe that if you supply people with information in plain English, yeah. you will get somewhere eventually. 
Where do you want the main target to be, though? Is it to the general public or is it to the medical profession? Um, I mean, who who is the important receiver? Of this well, situation? we would like to know. We've tried both ends of the spectrum. We've, I've, I've, I've had um, contact at, at a cabinet level that haven't worked. Well, there's no scientists in the government, are there? So exactly. That was exactly the point I made earlier on. They don't understand science. Yeah. So they're influenced by, by a body of scientists who have their interests of the points of view. I don't know how anyone could not be interested. On the other hand, we tried to supply HCL tablets to people on the front line of the COVID crisis. So, mm. yeah. I suppose they had a lot to deal with then. Mm. I don't know. Yeah. That one. You're very kind. <laughs> I think there should be there could be something in the name once you get acid in the name. Acid yeah. like yeah. general public. Acid yeah. attacks. Yeah. 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 I think you need to think well, about marketing name. Like surgic acid. Yeah, that's right. Could you call it something else? I wonder. Well, it has gone through a whole series of brand names. You've seen Sterilox on there, you might have seen Salmox, you might have seen uh, other names it's, coming up. It's a negative okay. word, acid. Yes. Well, yeah. just thinking about acid attacks, mm -hmm. alkali attack, just recently. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, we, we've got, we bought a whole pile of this stuff in the COVID crisis, and we've still got quite a bit left. Um, that's not short, what? Yeah, not, it's not, it's not 10 pounds, is it? Eight pounds, I think. Eight pounds, mm -hmm. fifty, And that would make. 400 litres of pure water of, clean. Well, of 1,000 1, ppm, I have seen. So it, yeah. so it, it, it is ridiculously cheap of what it would achieve. Yeah. And of course, you know, in the kitchen generally, you know, you're squirting the things off, but that's largely surface active detergents and things like that to clean. Not necessarily to sterilize. Yes, of the product we're, we're trying to sell here is um, pure NADCC. Lots of NHS that they use detergents with as well, which are not warranted for the uses we've described. Uh, over the decades that the trust has been going and the, the knowledge has been there, there have been conferences which have been concentrated on this topic, bringing academics together for different disciplines, or haven't they? Uh, no, in fact, it's in the back of my mind that a conference of people who are in various disciplines coming together for a, for a discussion of that type would be very useful. I would have thought that would have been a good step forward. Yes, I agree. We'll be showing the site yeah. to the people who want to see the site, so they'll cynically try and shoot it down. And that's the joy of the conference. Or if they can, then you can just. Yeah, I think that's a very worthwhile suggestion. But I know the trust has some funds, and obviously there's commercial companies who should have best interest, I think. Yeah. I would have thought organizing a conference, a global conference, would be a yes. good way to do it. I agree. I'd be surprised if you didn't get interest because of what you're showing there. I think it's very recent company. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. The, 20, the 1915 interest seems like the 2020. Yes, the 1915 was there to show the, 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 the dire state of acceptability of the product that's been around for so long. But yes, everything is 23, 24. Yeah, good point. But you can more contractually include preservation. Well, that's a really interesting thing to say. Um, I did a lot of the initial work on perishable goods, as you saw there. But do you know the most conservative? Yeah. industries in the world, it's the horticultural and agricultural industry, they have a process of production which works. Okay? Yeah. Why should they interrupt and reconfigure that mm -hmm. to use something which gives them probably a marginal benefit? Mm -hmm. You've got to integrate it. It's not, all, it's not always satisfactory every good. Um, food produce which has craggy surfaces like a potato is not too good because there's lots of crevices and refuges for microflora. Um, some uh, foodstuffs are extremely moisture sensitive, like strawberries. So there's no blankets or the process you can put into it. You've got to get into a production cycle, acceptable, integrated into that. And that's quite a challenge. I was going to do that about targeting. I was going to mention it there. But yeah, it's like you're dealing with an extremely reluctant um, industry to accept technical innovation if it doesn't give them an outstanding advantage. I went to uh, Born Salads in Lincolnshire, who produce 
probably 70% of all the bag salad for all supermarkets, different brands. And they wash thoroughly uh, the, the bags, but it's all dilute uh, hydrochloride. Mm -hmm. And if you open the bag, what do you smell? Mm -hmm. And you know, if they don't use hypochlorous acid instead of sodium hypochlorite, it would have been a probably biologically more effective preservation wise, and also would have been unpleasant side effects of the smell. Mm -hmm. But you, there's such intransigence, as you say. Mm -hmm. Why rock the boat? You know, it's acceptable, it's been passed by the regulators. Mm -hmm. uh, the FSA are happy. I was taken by um, that thing you showed about um, washing seeds, and then they they um, were less um, prone to attack, prone to attack, but also they grew bigger. Yeah. And that reminded me very much of the situation of how we got antibiotics into the food chain uh, in such a big way that yeah. it wasn't just that um, it stopped chickens from getting um, infections, they actually grew yeah. bigger. The growth, the growth promoters is what we call them. They yeah. had antibiotics. Mm. And that it was that that gave the takeoff for that antibiotics in meat rather than the, the um, right. reducing infection. Yeah. Um, and so there is that, you know, the benefit of, of, of growth, but that's only appropriate to particular. That's like yeah, so those, those experiments were done on the basis of what's called seed priming, yeah. which conditions the seed into a state of higher energy growth yeah. prior to their actual germination. Mm -hmm. But there, yeah, it gave the clue that the, the effect was greater than just the antibiotic, anti microbial effect of the yeah. 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 So you, went, you said you went to the, uh, the company which made 70% of the bags of. Of, of salad products. Mm. Why didn't you go to the one which makes five percent? Mm -hmm. They've got much more of a vested interest in change. If you've got seventy percent of the market, why the hell would you change? Exactly, yeah. So you go find a guy who's making five percent and say he could use those the one who's making seven percent. You may get some traction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You've only got to hook someone like Tesco, and <laughs> and they will oblige the people to change. Mm -hmm. yeah. We didn't have chance with supermarkets. I learned a lot about the character of supermarkets. Yeah. <laughs> we were practically, sort of we were practically, yeah. practically thrown out of the premises by Tesco and welcomed by Waitrose. Very strange. I have a question of the, uh, the Zoom from JAMT. Uh, this was from halfway through the, uh, the talk. Uh, with regard to the use in preservation, e.g., of the grapes you showed and carrots using HOCL. Does it have any observable effect on the fruit and vegetables? Flavor, skins? Um, we didn't eat them at the end. Shame on us. <laughs> They've been in the fridge a long time. Um, we did do some tests on browning. And I seem to remember cutting up various browning-prone perishable fruits, and it reduced the amount of browning taking place. Yeah, but I'll say that for what it's worth. I don't know whether it has a commercial value, but it did stop that um, excess oxidation attack for some reason or another. I don't, can't explain it. That's right. It does. It, yeah. 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 It's, it's enzyme mediated brownie. Yeah. Nine o'clock, should we be? Yeah. 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 If, um, if any of the body of the Kirk fancy any of this, you're very welcome. I've got a shared load on it. In the spirit of, of CSTS generosity, if you take one of these little tags, there's a 10% discount for delivery in the science that we have that we, that we, that we do. Um, and secondly, uh, any, if you want to make orders before the end of Feb, you're going to give you an extra 10%. Mm -hmm. we, we, we as a, as a, as a trust need to raise this money uh, you know, to, to keep going. 
We've got very low overheads. Our principal overheads actually are the costs of the website mm -hmm. and the hosting charges. So we can talk to them along, but we're not going to make any impact. And certainly when you start to look at <coughs> conferences, mm -hmm. you know, have to talk much bigger money. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's a case of finding sponsors and things like that. But um, that's, the, that's the task that's before us. And there's only three of us. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, yeah. thank you all for coming. Thank you for the discourse. Thank you for the ideas. Thank you very much. Thank you.